And then this is the picture that he gave me. Because it's the Sanctity of Life Sunday. And it's this picture of a mom being pregnant. And then that image of what da Vinci drew as humanity, right? The, the picture of a, of a person who's made in God's image is being released fearfully and wonderfully made, right? Psalm 139, 14. It's being released into the earth. This person, this amazing creation in the image of God is being released into the earth. And what happens to that child is partly due to how we receive that child corporately, how we receive that child. And one of the reasons this country was started is so that people could have a fair shot. We hold this truth to be self-evident that every person is created equal. No caste system like there was in India. Everybody here is going to get a shot. Everybody here is going to be presumed innocent until you can prove them guilty. And that's a great thing, but nobody else had done that before. Amazing heritage we have. Some bad stuff, of course. Of course. Nobody had ever even tried this experiment before. I'm going to go off on that tangent. But here's this little baby that I, I'm guessing the one on the, on the top there, 30 weeks, premature, would have died 50 years ago. But today they can keep these children alive so much longer. And why abortion should just be so important in your mind on the Sanctity of Life Sunday, and that we, we have allowed it to become such a common thing in the American culture that we don't even talk about it anymore. It's just like a given. It's not okay. It's not okay. Not in this church, anyway. There might, there might be other churches that say they're pro-choice. I just don't know how you could ever match this up with that opinion. They're, they're defending late-term abortions or even post-birth, let the baby die. I'll tell you, that, that's going to bring a really bad outcome if we don't do something about it. We can't say we didn't try. That, that's the bottom line. Whether we change it or not, that's one thing. But, you know, William Wilberforce is famous for what he did in England to stop the slave trade. On paper, impossible for one guy to make that much of a difference. Read the book, Amazing Grace. He made the difference. Eric Metaxas wrote the book. Powerful what one person can do. So you might think, well, what can I do against that? What you can do is pray. And wherever two are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I'm there with you. And if one puts 1,000 and two put 10,000, there's 400,000 people going on to the give me 15, give them 15 prayer from Dutch Sheets every day. So if you think we should have been praying for America before the election, we need to be praying even more now. Just stick with abortion. But you could change that conversation to the curriculum for our kids in school. Telling us there's no difference between a boy and a girl. And the kid gets to just pick whatever they want. And if you don't agree as parents, we can come and take your child. That's why we have guns. <laughs> You're just going to let somebody take your child? Six-year-old kid that is confused about being a boy or a girl? You planted the seed in his brain to confuse him about it in the first place. No. Not okay. Not on our watch, church, right? Not on our watch. I'm going to finish in Romans just a couple verses. Thank you. Romans 8, 9. <laughs> The expressence of God's nature. I'm going to try to say it a few times so you get used to this word. The spirit in us is guiding us. But if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to God and is not a child of God. So your first identity is child of God. Right? If somebody says, who are you? You say, I'm a child of the living God. Son or daughter of the living God. That's first. Not Italian or whoever else you might be by ethnic or whatever else you do. Sometimes people say, I'm an accountant. <laughs> well, no, you're not an accountant. That's what you do. That's not who you are. Right? I'm a child of God. First answer. That's who you are first. Primary. <laughs> 
If Christ lives in you, though your natural body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he provides. Mm. I like that. Did I jump ahead? I think I might have jumped one. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to seven. The mind of the flesh with its sinful pursuits, there it is, good, is actively hostile to God. So can I just make a commercial when you're talking to unsafe people? They don't have awareness of the Holy Spirit? So this was me, the mind of my flesh. With its sinful pursuits, I was actively hostile to God before I became a Christian because I wanted to fulfill the lusts of my flesh. I didn't know there was any other option. Everybody I look up to, that's what they did, and I wanted to be good at what they did. I was just following the wrong leader. I didn't know about the Lord. So this is who you're speaking to when you're talking to an unsafe person. That, that person doesn't submit itself to God's law and can't until they say yes to Jesus. And those who are in the flesh living the life that caters to that sinful appetite cannot please God. However, you are not living in the flesh. <laughs> say that with me, okay? I am not. Not living in the flesh. Mm. Thank you, Lord. I'm not controlled by that sinful nature, but I'm living in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit lives in me. Yeah. How much better is that? Oh, much better. Thank you, Dave. And what's he doing? He's directing you and guiding you. But if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to, you don't belong to the Lord, and you're not a child of God. But if Christ lives in you, though your natural body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he provides. Yeah. Oh, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God as a yielded vessel to the Lord. He fills you with his spirit. Then you take the time and you burn the word in. Worship music, whatever ways you can get it in, audio books. There's so many ways that you can be listening to the word, get it in your spirit in the course of your day. It'll help keep you calm. I'm getting a little riled up up here. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite verses. Boy, I think of it all the time. He, Romans 8, 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. Yeah. This, yeah. this is going to get resurrected someday in a new form. Hallelujah. <laughs> but while we're here, that spirit lives inside of us. And verse 12 says, So then, brethren and brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but the obligation is not to our flesh. That human nature, that worldliness, that sinful capacity that still tries to resurrect inside of us, even though we're Christians. That's why it's called warfare, because there's this competing going on for our attention. Sure, I can eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God's just being stingy. Yeah, how silly is that? No, no, I've learned. I can trust him. How about you? This has got all the answers, but i got to dig in to find them. And I've got to have friends around me that are modeling this for me because they encourage me and we strengthen each other because we're living in a family of other believers that keep, you know, I love that one where it says that we spur one another on to love and good works. Spur, that's what a cowboy uses to get the horse to move. We spur one another on. Hey, what are you doing, Dave? Snap out of it. Trish likes that line in that movie. Remember that? Moonstruck? Pfft. Snap out of it. It's the five-fold ministry. 